used as a weapon, right? What do you, do you use them as a pointer or to Just discipline to students? Or? <laughs> Okay. Good. Yeah. So, so um, what I wanted to talk about is spectrum sharing, and and you're probably wondering, what what on earth does first of all, what on earth is spectrum sharing, and what does that have to do with information architecture? Um, so the reason why I chose this particular topic to talk about was that this is where I do my research. Um, I published quite a few papers in the air in the on the topic of spectrum sharing but actually as I hope I will be able to convince you it has quite a bit to do with information architecture or there's a role important role for information architecture in in spectrum sharing um, so this is what I'm going to do I'm going to first establish a context that is why you should care about it because um, probably you haven't heard about it about the concept yet. Um, I'm going to talk about white spaces, the idea of white spaces, and then there's a, in the US we talk about sharing between government uses and private commercial uses of spectrum, so I want to talk about that a little bit. This is a little bit different than the white spaces idea, and then we'll talk a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm not used to, what I like is you know, for us to have more of a conversation. So I hope you feel comfortable um, asking questions and answering questions that I have. Um, anyway, so the motivation. Does anybody recognize this? No. It's it's about. Um, not, not about a six, six hours away from the White House in time zone shifts. So in the same time zone as where you are right now. Uh, Italy. Somebody said Italy. Good. Good. Where, where in Italy? Uh, Vatican. Vatican. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> and the date is 2005. Um, in case you know, I know most of you are young, so you probably don't have a working memory of what 2005 was, but in 2005, <coughs> Pope Benedictus was, um, was, um, uh, um, I don't know, what's the word? What's that? He yeah, he's made Pope, thank you. He became Pope. Or the, it was announced, uh, whatever. There's, a, there's an official term for this, but I can't think of it right now. Okay, so this is in 2013. This was just this year, in the Vatican, same place. So, the difference. In, in here, these white things, what are they? Cell phones. Cell phones, yes, thank you. Right. Tablets, I, iPads, and you don't see any of them. Actually, if we go back to the previous page, somebody had one here. Maybe there's one here, too. This was, two, 2005 was two years before the iPhone. iPhone came in 2007, okay? Um, so, whoops, went back too far. So, here's the difference, okay? So, each one of these devices, and it's the device that you have in your pocket right now, also, um, that you're probably texting on behind the back, right? <laughs> um, each one of these requires the use of radio spectrum. Um, you probably right now are connected to, to MOLDA's um, Wi-Fi network if you have it, if, you, if you're here. But you may also be connected to a 3G or a 4G kind of a network, depending on what kind of a service you have. What this picture says is the demand for radio waves has gotten much, much higher. Um, and it's not the only thing that's using radio spectrum. It's perhaps the biggest thing, but it's not the only thing. There are a lot of companies who are wanting to make money off of this. In, in Molde, you ha in Norway, you have Telnor, and you have probably three or four other carriers. I don't know what they are, but they're all trying to make money. They compete with each other, and each one of them needs radio spectrum. Well, the, the problem is that you can't manufacture radio spectrum. You can't make more spectrum. It's a finite resource that has to be shared, just kind of like coastline or, 
or something like this. There's, there's only so much of it. Um, so the, the problem that we have, can, this picture sort of illustrates it. Again, what the heck is he talking about, right? So we have technology innovations that happen very quickly. In two, 2007, we had the iPhone, right? And now, just last month, it was the iPhone, is it 5? I think, five, yes, iPhone 5 came out. That's, sorry? 5S. 5S, thank you. I don't pay such close attention, obviously. And, right, the S and the C came out. So that is, um, what, f at least five generations, probably six generations. I oh, know, that's right, they had the 4, the 4S, and then the 3G. So it's more than that. It's probably closer to um, six or seven generations of an iPhone since 2005, and it's 2013, that's seven years. That's practically a new generation every year. <clears throat> Companies like Apple need to make it worth your while to get the newest iPhone. Does anybody get the iPhone 5S, by the way? No? You didn't stand in line? No? Um, but a lot of people do. A lot of people want it. And Apple's not the only company. Samsung is coming out with new phones all the time. So we have technology, and especially in handsets, that's iterating very quickly. We have um, radio technology. The, so, so in 2007, the 3G services were just becoming available. In 2012 or so, we started seeing LTE services, maybe a little bit earlier. That's, you know, roughly five years. So in the, in the five years that it took to, you know, five to seven years that it took to get from 3G to 4G in wireless technology, we had, you know, five generations of um, handset technology. So, you know, we have, we have technolo radio technology is iterating relatively slowly, and there's, there's more actually than even what you know about that's happening. It's not just the, the 3G and 4G. There are, if you read into the radio technology, there's so-called femtocell systems and macrocell systems, and there's all kinds of innovations happening in radio. But then each one of those requires different and more kinds of spectrum. We have more competition, we have industry consolidation. And so these companies are fighting with each other for access to the spectrum. And so when there's not enough, then guess what they do? They talk to the government and say, hey, we need more spectrum. And the, you know, we, we, I hope you agree with me that the government can't manufacture spectrum, it can't make new spectrum, so it has to think about how it reorganizes, reallocates, and reassigns spectrum. That happens on very slow cycles, on the order of decades. Um, so this is the motivation, this is why we need spectrum sharing. These companies have new technology, Radio technology is moving faster, and we can't keep up with demand for the spectrum because it gets reallocated too slowly. So an inter intermediate step is to say, okay, well, we have a finite amount of spectrum. How do we play nice together? I mean, they told us this in kindergarten, right? We had to share our toys. Do you remember that, Sherry? You didn't have to share your toys in kindergarten? We always did. Um, but it's the same idea, so you have to share. And then the question becomes, well, okay, if you agree with the idea that you have to share, if you think, if you believe what I just told you about the motivation for spectrum and, and that th there is more demand, then we have to figure out how exactly we're going to share spectrum. Um, so when you share spectrum, you in inevitably have interference. If you go back to your kindergarten, do you remember a time maybe where you were playing with a toy and your friend wanted to play with the same toy. Did that ever happen to you? No? Come on. Do you have brothers and sisters? Did they ever? Come on, work with me. Yes, <laughs> yes of course, yeah. That's in the radio, it's called interference. When, when two people want to use the same band, it's interference. You, you might, if you listen to shortwave radio, you hear interference all the time. If you listen to AM radio in the evening, you hear interference. You hear, you're trying to listen to a station and there's other stations that come in. 
So despite what people say, and the technologists are developing, trying to develop techniques where, they're, where they avoid interference as much as possible, but the reality is when you share, you have interference. It's just like your toys in kindergarten. You, you know, when you have, multiple, you have one toy and multiple kids, you're going to have interference. You're going to have contention for that. <clears throat> so um, the issues that come up when you, in, when you try to manage interference is well, you start thinking about what, what you need to do in order to do that. Well, the one thing you can do is to try to sense spectrum. Bef and and these, the, the, the Wi-Fi actually that's in your radios, in your computers, does this automatically. Before it sends, it listens to see if, if, it, if it may send, if anybody else is using it. And only if nobody else is using it, it sends. But if somebody else is using it, it waits. So that's the same kind of an idea that they try to use in, in spectrum sharing networks. Um, so sensing is an important piece of this. But sensing in the radio sense is hard. Um, because the, the, these, um, these handsets that we all like to use um, are capable of receiving signals at very low power levels. Um, it's one of the ways in which, for example, we can get them to be this small because they don't use a lot of power, we can have relatively small batteries. If you ever watch an old movie and see some of the old um, mobile phones, I mean, watch um, a movie from the 1970s or the 1980s, and they had mobile phones that were, you know, big. They were, um, you know, like, like this. Couldn't put them in your pocket. You could put them in your briefcase, but that's, that's about all. How did they reduce the size of that? Well, certainly technology improvements, but also by reducing transmit power. Reducing transmit power means smaller batteries. Smaller batteries means smaller and lighter devices. Um, so sensing is difficult because you have to sense at very, very small signal levels in order to avoid interference. And the other part of it is you need to be able to enforce agreements that exist. If I have rights to spectrum, I need to have some kind of an assurance that, you know, if you interfere with me, that I can somehow um, come up to an amicable settlement of some kind. Um, it's, these are all fairly complicated things. We're not going to go through all of these. I'm just trying to give, a, give you a broader sense. And then the part, part of what I'm actually thinking about a lot right now is are these questions of enforcement and, and when you have questions about enforcement, the question is, well, what kinds of rights are there anyway? Um, and it turns out that it's not, that's not an easy question to answer. We have, we have uh, usage rights, we have transmission rights, we have reception rights, we have interference rights, we have all kinds of rights that are bundled together. Um, and one of the interesting questions that I'm fooling around with these days is, you know, what happens if you disentangle these rights? Um, there's an economist who recently passed away at the age of 102 or something like this. His name was Ronald Coase. Ronald Coase is a very famous economist and, and did a lot in terms of um, talking about how rights get organized in, in different kinds of settings. So that's what I'm, these are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about um, I have a student who's actually studying this whole question of risk management and spectrum sharing and building models for that. But anyway, it has nothing to do with information architecture, it's just sort of setting up the broader context. Um, so spectrum sharing isn't just a theory. Um, I, I'll talk mostly about the U.S. Um, because it's what I, what I know a lot better. Um, spectrum sharing is happening in the EU as well, or th this whole the TV White Spaces initiative is, is available and active in the European Union as well as in Japan. Um, it's perhaps not quite as far along, partly because in the EU ha you have multiple jurisdictions that are involved. So, you know, it's one thing for the EU to set policy, but these all then have to be implemented in the various national bodies, and all of this takes time. Um, 
the EU has invested a lot of money um, in the research area in um, the area of spectrum sharing. There was a um, Cog EU project, there was um, um, Sandora that recently finished. Um, tomorrow I'll be in Brussels talking to a, a CRSI, is Cognitive Radio something something, um, which is also dealing with spectrum sharing. It's another research initiative. So the, the, the EU, from a research perspective, is really interested in this topic. It's, they see it as important um, for the future. So it's not, this is not just U.S. It's, it's really a worldwide kind of an in initiative, especially among industrialized countries. I should say that a lot of these problems of spectrum sharing are, are mostly um, er problems when, when population densities are high. So it may never be an issue for Norway because you don't have that many people here. And even in Oslo, it's a fairly small city. Where you see problems in spectrum scarcity are cities like you know New York, Chicago, Washington, Tokyo, Beijing, and these are massively huge cities where you have large populations who are simultaneously trying to access it. Or you have spectrum problems in the, the St. Peter's example that I showed you not long ago. You have a lot of people in a small area. Um, this will be the problem in, what is it, another month when Molde plays Tron time, right? You have a lot of people in the stadium in Oslo and everybody's wanting to text about the game you know, or send tweets or videos or images. Well, how do you manage all of that? Because you have a lot of people in a small area. How do you get enough spectrum to, to, to that group? So that's, those are places where spectrum sharing becomes an interesting problem. Um, so TV white spaces, I think I talk about this a little bit more, but it, it, so, so let me just go over it briefly. TV white spaces, um, and then there's these issues of federal commercial sharing. These are the particular frequency bands. These are frequency bands that are interesting because they align with, um, with international band plans. So the, I keep on pulling this device up, but devices like this um, have, have a number of radios in them. This one w has certainly the Wi-Fi radio, so it'll operate at, which is at, 2.4 uh, gigahertz or 2400 megahertz, so it's somewhere above here. It might have a 5,000 uh, megahertz radio, which would be below here. It has one at 800 megahertz, which is, you know, if we compare it's up here, it has one in the um, 1100 megahertz in here. So it has a lot of radios in it. Yours does too, um, but it doesn't have an infinite amount. Um, in, in the U.S., we have four nationwide carriers, the smallest of which has traditionally been T-Mobile, which is the, from the German carrier. It's the U.S. operation from the German carrier. Um, they've been slow to get the iPhone. They just got it last year. And one of the reasons for it is that they had a different band plan. Their band plan, the way in the frequencies that the handsets use, that their radio towers use, was more aligned with what was happening in Europe than w with what was happening in the U.S. So they couldn't buy, um, you, couldn't you couldn't get a, an iPhone on the T-Mobile network because it wasn't designed to work on the frequencies that T-Mobile used. T-Mobile actually re-engineered their whole network so that it was aligned with what the large carrier AT&T was doing um, Apple wasn't going to change its iPhone design to meet T-Mobile's requirements. T-Mobile had to re-engineer their network to meet the iPhone, which is kind of interesting when you think about it. Um, so the power of manufacturers, and the, the manu manufacturers don't want to build a lot of unique variations. I mean, this is something you learn in, in your various uh, product management classes. I mean, if you get you want to get scale economies, which means that you don't want to have a lot of um, variations. So these frequencies are all um, ones in which Europe and Australia are building um, radios for towers and systems, so that carriers, uh, equipment manufacturers are building handsets here. So a lot of the U.S. carriers want to get into the game. 
they want to be able to use these frequencies. The problem is that they're being used by the federal government, the U.S. government. So anyway, that's, that's, the, that's the overview. Um, so let's talk a little bit about white spaces. What, what, what is a white space? It's not this board. In the radio sense, what we can, we can use a picture like this where we have spatial dimension. So this is ge geographic. We have different frequencies. And then in this ver um, depth dimension, we have time. So um, in the television sense, when you, when you watch television, you can watch television any time. And so the sender that you're watching is always available to watch. It's the channel is always on. They're always transmitting on it. So all of these things are constant in time. Um, but they operate at different frequencies. We have, uh, how, many, how many television stations over the air do you have here? Sorry? Okay. So, so you have three or four <laughs> television sets that you can get without a satellite or a cable, right? How many do you get f where you are? Does anybody not use cable or, or satellite? Anybody just use over the air? No? Just if use uh, internet. <laughs> oh, use the internet. Okay. <laughs> well, if you were to use over the air television, you know, regular, you know, with the TV antennas that are pointing wherever, you'd have a number of stations that you can get. These stations operate at different frequencies. Um, so that's channel one, channel three, and so on. Well, television signals that they, they the, in the UHF and VHF bands are um, in the seven to 800 megahertz. Um, and um, they have a pretty good Rate propagation property, property, the radio waves travel fairly well, but they also have a limited distance depending on the power that you use. So you could use this channel five over and over again at different distances if they're far enough apart. So you have this channel separation, this geographic channel separation. Um, in, in the U.S., we can give, the, at least in, in the Pittsburgh area, the topography is relatively flat. We have some hills, but, you know, if you go to the west from Pittsburgh, it's, it's fairly flat, and so you can give examples of Pittsburgh and Cleveland and so forth, but that doesn't mean a whole lot to you. Um, if you, uh, even imagining a flat topography may be kind of <laughs> strange for you. Um, but if you had a flat topography, then you can visualize this. In, in Norway, we have, you know, so we were driving around a bit yesterday. So, you know, we went up, up to, to Bud and went through this tunnel. What was the name of the town on the other side of the tunnel? Mm -hmm. It's not really a tunnel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so, so, you know, if you're imagining people living on the other side of the tunnel, they couldn't get television stations in Molde because the mountain's in the way. They would get television stations from somewhere else if they weren't using satellite. Um, so we have this spatial separation. So you could use the same channel without interference. The only people who would suffer are people who happen to live right on the edge of the mountain. And there's probably not very many people who do that, I'm guessing. <laughs> Maybe there are, I don't know. Um, so the, the idea of white spaces is that there are, there are regions, there are channels that are separated in frequency and space and perhaps in time from each other so that somebody else could use it. Okay, so if you imagined, um, you know, if you were, um, what's the, na the town across the fjord? It's maybe a better example. Restless. What's that? Restless. Restless, right. So if they have a television station and Molde has one, the radio signals could easily propagate across the fjord. There's no mountain in the way, right? So you wouldn't want to use the same channel for both of, if, if there's a tr television transmitter there and one in Molde, you wouldn't want to use the same channel. You want to set those off so that people in Molde could get television from there and vice versa. Um, but there aren't that many people in either town, so you maybe only have two or three channels, so there may be extra 
frequencies available that you could use for your Wi-Fi. You know, so you, you could use it for this football game that you're perhaps interested in at the stadium. I know it's not going to be here, but... Um, so these are white spaces. These are, these are areas where there's no demand for television. Um, and there's no transmitter in, in a reasonable area. <clears throat> so um, white spaces are a general term. TV is a particular case. And we're interested in television because television takes up a fair amount of radio spectrum. Um, and since, just like you see for yourselves, you're getting your television over the internet, you're getting it over cable, over satellite. Most, of, none of you raised your hands when I asked how many people get it over the air, so I'm assuming none of you do. So why have a television transmitter then? That's an interesting policy question. But if you wanted to share this, well, what would you need to know? What kind of information would you want to know if, if you wanted to share television frequencies? Anybody guessing? I mean, we can go back to this picture. Maybe that'll help st stimu stimulate your thinking. What would you want to know if you wanted to use this? If you, assuming you didn't want to interfere with somebody. Yeah, so you need to know the frequency. Is somebody else using, is, is there a radio station there, a television station at this particular frequency, at this location, right? So you need location and you need frequency. Those are Im really important things to know. So you need to know where you are, you need to know where the television transmitters are, so that to see if you're far enough away in space and whether you're far enough away in frequency from channels that you might interfere with. Um, so there's two ways of doing this. One of them is sensing. You can, you know, as basically putting your finger up in the air and seeing which way the wind is blowing kind of thing. Um, in this case, you're putting a radio antenna up and listening for signal energy. But I, t I argued, I claimed earlier that this was a hard problem. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time justifying that. I'm just asking you to accept that this is a hard problem and, and it's expensive. <clears throat> just to give you an idea, the cheapest spectrum sensor that I've found so far is about uh, 1,500 US. But that's, that's, and that's just a very new product. Typically, people spend more like 10,000 US for a spectrum sensor and more. So it's not cheap. It's not one that you'd want to have at every house, because it's way more than what your television set costs. So if that's the case, why bother doing it? So instead, we use databases. And now that we're starting to talk about databases, maybe now suddenly you're saying, oh, well, maybe this does have something to do with information architecture after all, because you're concerned with how to interact with databases when you think about infra information architecture generally. Um, so there are some TV white spaces databases. Um, and here's some examples. One of them is run by a company called Spectrum Bridge, which you've probably never heard of. And there's another company called Google, which you might have heard of, that also runs a uh, Spectrum database. And so let's see what Spectrum, OK, so Spectrum Bridge says, let's see. Let's say I want to use a fixed device, and, and what that means is, is that the device doesn't move around. It's in one place all the time. And, and they want to know this because the FCC has different rules for, for um, fixed wise devices, portable devices, and wireless microphones. So when you watch a television show, um, let's say, uh, I don't know if they have, uh, like, uh, competition, or, or, or they, I'm sure they have programs in, on television where entertainers will sing and, you know, they, they're singing to a wireless microphone moving around on stage. They use television band channels. So these, you're wanting to use white spaces for data conflicts with these 
so-called wireless microphones. So in case you were wondering what the entertainers use, they're all TV band devices. So if I um, put the address of my office in, Let's see what it says. Okay, so it's shown my address. This is where my office is, right here. Um, here, I'll zoom it out for you, just so you can see it in context. Pittsburgh is here. We're sort of between Washington and Chicago, in case you happen to not remember your address. And we're right in the city. So what this what this says is that these are our channels that, um, that I could use for my, uh, if I wanted to build a TV white space device. I could use channel 2, I can use channel 5, 6. This tells you the frequency range. You were asking about that. One thing you'll notice is that there's 6 megahertz channels. It's the difference between these two. That's how much bandwidth you'd have to use. Six megahertz is actually fairly small. It's a standard television channel pretty much everywhere in the world. But if you compare that to what your mobile phone uses, what, what the, I mean, the Wi-Fi that you're using here is capable of operating over about 100 megahertz. So this is, is a fairly small channel that's available. But it's still pretty good. And so I have a choice of a number of channels that I'm able to, to do. Now they don't tell me, the noise floor is, is how much uh, interference I could expect. And I need to buy an account in order to view what that is. So I'm not going to do that. So this is, this is one example of a database or a website that gives you this information. What do you think about this website? Do you like it? Do you think it's good? Do you think it's bad? If you, I mean, you've been spending some time doing web design in here, right? So, is it? How is the information in the database added to the database? Is it just based on location or in some sense? It's based on location. Okay. Um, right, and so what the, what the FCC, is that they get, what, Spectrum Bridge gets the data from the FCC, and the FCC has a, has a list of where television stations are located. Um, so they have the, the, where the transmitting tower is, how high the tower is, that makes a difference, what energy, what the power is that they transmit from, and, and then they estimate what the signal power is based on that, or the, the interference is based on that. They use something called a propagation model. It's a mathematical model that estimates how radio waves propagate. And a lot of these models, by the way, are, that the FCC uses aren't the most modern ones. It, it turns, it's a complicated story, and they're certainly capable of using it, but, but they don't. <clears throat> so this is an example of, of what a database looks like, um, what you get from a database. So this is fine for humans. If you're a machine, though, if you're a radio, this is maybe not so good because you have to you, you, th you have to think in terms of an API, and so you know you're you're at that point wanting to think about what does a, a machine to machine interface look like for this database. Um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go to that though. But just by contrast, Google is also a um, an authorized um, TV white space database provider, and um, they have, not surprisingly, a very different approach to a database. Um, so here we can browse. I actually haven't played around with it very much, but let's see, if we go back to, to Pittsburgh, um, see what this gives us. Um,
So you can see, this is now the topographic map. You can see that it's a little bit hilly in the Pittsburgh area. Um, So my office is right in this area right here. Okay. I wonder if I can there. Nice. So let's say it's right about here. Let's see what Google tells us in terms of what's available. <coughs> Ah, there. So this tells you um, different channels, and it tells you there's seven channels that are available. Um, and uh, it looks like channel three and channel four is not available. I'm guessing it's because there's an X there. Um, it shows you the frequency, I think. Um, Yeah, that's right. So the green ones are the available ones. Um, these are probably the station numbers, not so much the, mm -hmm. the channels. But this is a different view of a database. This is, to me, this is a bit, in, a bit more information rich. Um, but again, it's not surprising that Google would take a very maps-oriented approach. So, so here you can see the stations that are um, operating. Here's a wireless mic, for example, that is, it's channel 36 is, and channel 39 are used, reserved for wireless mics. There's some radio astronomy channels. When you listen, you know, if you were doing, if you were trying to listen to um, quasars and whatnot, you'd, you'd be listening here. And then these these are these are all number these are all call letters for television stations. So um, one of the one of the first uh, television and radio stations that in the world was actually KDKA. It was from West at the time Westinghouse Corporation. So they operate obviously on a number of channels here. And. Um, so what they tell you is that you can't use that because the fixed device is um, not available. What happens when we go to a, a portable device? See what happens. The whole spectrum changes. So there's different channels that are available, available if you're using a portable device. So the application matters. So if you're starting to think about you know, what would I need to do in order to use a television white space? What would I, what kind of an uh, interface would I need to have to that? <coughs> These are examples. Um, if you, let's see, you could have different um, antenna heights. So this is, what if we had a higher antenna? I wonder what would happen. What do you think will happen? Anybody guess? Will you have more channels or fewer channels while Google's trying to figure this out? More. You think so? I think so. Okay. Well, let's see how good your int intuition is. Ah, we have none. Oh well, right? <laughs> The, so so the, the, when, you, when you put your antenna higher, you cover more area. So that means that <coughs> you'd be interfering over a greater um, area. I mean, so you, you never took a course in radio, so I wouldn't have expected you to know it. It's a good guess. Coin flip, right? You could have gone either way. <coughs> anyway, so... Um, if we have a lower antenna, if we go one meter let's say two meters, about the height of a person. Yeah, so if you have a lower antenna, you have more channels available to you. So anyway, we could fool around with this database all day. It'd be great fun, but perhaps not so interesting. Are we running out of time? Oh, okay. 
So I will leave you pretty much with this. So, you know, the things to ask yourself, what did they put into this database and why did they put, into, put it in? How would you use it? How, I mean, it's one thing to use it as a human being the way we did. It's good for planning purposes, but if you're building a, a database, a device interface for a database, it might be less useful. Because, so, so you need to have some kind of an API to a database like this so that it becomes actually useful in practice. So, you know, if you were building this kind of an information service, you would have to um, think about what the use case is. The use case typically is a radio. Now, your radio would maybe be powered up in Pittsburgh for temporary use, let's say at a sporting event. You figure out what channels that you can use. You might, so you need to be able to query the database to f first learn where you are, which means that you need some kind of a GPS, some kind of a location identification system. Second, <coughs> you would need to know, um, uh, you need to have an internet connection, right? So that puts constraints on the device that you can use as well, because you need some way of querying the database. Um, if, you, if you're just starting up a radio, I mean, think about when you go to the airport and you first searching for a Wi-Fi access point. Well, you can't communicate anything until you log into that access point, so you need to have some kind of a secondary channel for the radio over which this um, query can be performed. Then you have the API that tells you what channels you can use, and you have to choose one of them. Um, and there's a little bit, you know, choosing the right channel is also a bit of a, um, you know, th there's, there's some factors involved with that, because you have to guess at who else might be using the same channels in order to get throughput. You have to coordinate all of the devices that you're trying to communicate with so that they all use the same frequency, otherwise it doesn't work. So um, I'm clearly not going to have time to talk about the other things, which is fine. Um, these are just different cases. The problems are somewhat different. Um, so I won't get into that. I'll just finish it off here. And I guess you, you have a chance now to give your own presentations on your projects, right? So I hope this, the, the, the purpose here was to connect a new advance in technology with the kinds of things you're doing. What you're doing is not just about people, it's also about machines, and it's not just about providing classical information like shopping or, you know, you think about Amazon, you think about information services. There are really technical things like this that apply as well. Think of applying, applying this to logistics, same kind of an issue. You know, how do you find out where inventory is located and what you do with that? Very similar type of a problem in many ways. So thank you for your attention. And, um, you know, if you have any questions afterwards, Judith knows how to get a hold of me, and I'll be happy to answer your questions by email. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I need to stop the camera.